Hi folks, welcome back. Today's video is one that's really exciting for me because this is going to be a supplemental video to my friend Matt Rittman's uh, Python animation, animation of the Colt Python. This video is going to come out a day or two after he releases that one as a supplemental resource to explain uh, some of the things that you're seeing in that animation. The animation does a great job. He's really done a beautiful, beautiful bit of work with that where it does cutaways, replays, where you can see a lot of things going on that are difficult to see, especially simultaneously on the actual revolver. But we're gonna go kind of based on what he's presented to you and go a little more in depth and give an explanation of what all's happening inside of the Colt Python. I have a disassembly video on the Python. This is not that, I'm not gonna be explaining how to do this. It's just going to be explanations of what you're actually looking at, how the parts are working. So let's go ahead and we'll show this is clear. And he starts by showing you in the animation how it loads. You have your thumb piece here that just pulls back and the cylinder can swing out. There's your extractor rod. Let's go ahead and get the side plate off of this so that you guys can see the details of the internals and we'll get to, to looking at that more closely. Okay, now we're zoomed in a little bit closer. We've got the grips off, we have the side plate off, we have the cylinder and crane taken away and we can look at the actual lock work here in a little bit more detail. Uh, some nomenclature things here to get out of the way. Now I will warn you, I may make some mistakes here because I'm going to try to use Colt's terminology, but I'm really used to the way Smith & Wesson calls parts. Let's go from uh, front to back. Of course, you have your barrel here. Uh, the back of the barrel is called the forcing cone. It's kind of countersunk back here to where it doesn't have any rifling and is a little bit wider. And that's what accepts the projectile as it passes through from the chamber. Here you have what you call the bolt. It's a spring-loaded part. It has a little spring associated with it there. It passes through the frame and is also visible here on the inside. That's the same part. Those are one piece. You have the trigger, of course. You have the pawl falling back from that. Uh, actually, before we fall back from that, on the opposite side of the trigger connected to it though, just like the pawl is, you have the transfer bar going back from the pawl, you have the rebound lever right here. It is tensioned by the main spring. This V-shaped spring is the main spring. The main spring on the upper side of it is hooked in to the hammer stirrup right here. This little link device is the hammer stirrup. This is the hammer. You have the hammer spur there. And on the front end, the hammer, you have the hammer strut. The hammer strut is what allows double action operation to happen. The hammer currently is resting against the frame. In order for the hammer to actually strike the firing pin, the transfer bar has to be up in position. This is what makes the revolver drop safe so that something can't bump the hammer and cause it to fire. It's a safety feature. You have your latch pin right here, and that is the internal piece that is affected by the latch that's on the side plate. It just dovetails in and is tensioned by this spring that sits in this cutout here has sort of a 
a dovetail shape to it. And just wedges in like that so it can ride forward and back. And that's the hole that then sits on this stud here and controls the latch pin. Your latch pin is what keeps the cylinder from just flopping out. So let's talk about the functions of these parts and how they interact. The first thing, of course, is if you're going to fire it in double action, you will pull the trigger. A lot of things happen simultaneously when the trigger is being pulled. Let's take a look at that. Make sure I keep my parts all pushed down in since they're not supported by the side plate. When you start pulling the trigger, you have several parts that immediately begin moving. Now at this point, we're not even moving the hammer back yet, but you'll see that you have quite a bit of motion going on. The front of the trigger, as it is moving down and back, is pulling the bolt down. You can see it beginning to move a little bit in there. And that is what unlocks the cylinder. The cylinder has these notches in it, these little stop notches. And as it rotates, it is locked whenever it reaches the bolt. That's what stops it and holds it in place and keeps it in alignment for the firing pin to strike the cartridge in the chamber. Coming back from that, you have the trigger, which interfaces on the back side with the pawl and the transfer bar. The transfer bar is on the underside and is connected to the trigger. The pawl is on the top side here where you can see it, and it is connected to the trigger also. From there, you'll see that the rebound lever is beginning to move. The rebound lever interfaces with the pawl and a little notch that's in the back of it has an angled surface and that's what keeps the pawl tensioned forward. So it's not going to flip flop around or anything like that. It keeps it tensioned forward. The rebound lever also is what's providing the tension to reset the trigger so that every time I'm pulling it back a little bit, it's not just staying there, it's being pushed back through that linkage there where it's this spring, the main spring is pushing the trigger forward by the bottom side of it, pushing on the rebound lever, pushing on the pawl, keeping the pawl tension forward, but then also putting a downward force on it that is then also pushing on the trigger. Since the trigger is being effect, affected by the pawl, that also affects the transfer bar and causes it to continuously reset. So pretty clever. The bolt there, of course, has a spring of its own. So then I pull it this far and I start feeling resistance. That resistance that I'm feeling is because the back of the trigger here right there is starting to contact the hammer strut. And so if I keep on pulling the trigger, we'll see that now the bolt has clicked back up because it sprung forward and then overrode. We see the hammer coming to the rear, the main spring, is further, further compressing. And what will happen now is that as the back end of the trigger here, the sear, passes the horizontal of its pivot pin, what it'll do is it starts actually moving forward. I mean, that just makes sense, right? It, it's moving forward again because it's past the horizontal. And so as it pivots, it's gonna move forward. And that means that as the hammer 
is rotating in the opposite direction. So the trigger is going from this perspective, counterclockwise, the hammer is going clockwise, that it's becoming further and further away from the hammer strut as they pass that horizontal position. And eventually they slip past each other and the hammer falls. By this time, all this travel has occurred. The transfer bar is fully up into position. So it allows a complete strike of the firing pin. And you can see the firing pin is poking through right there. Now, it's still under tension because the rebound arm is tensioning the pawl still. And it's giving all the spring pressure we need to reset. And there you have it. Pretty cool. Now, how does it work in single action operation? It's a little bit different. For the single action operation, the big difference is that we're not going to use the hammer strut to draw the hammer back. We're going to do that uh, by just pulling on the spur here, typically with the thumb. So let's pull it back with our thumb, but we'll see that all this other stuff is starting to move again. Why is that happening? Well, that's happening because the bottom end of the hammer has a sear surface on it, a sear engagement, where as the trigger, well, as the hammer moves back, it pulls the trigger up from the rear. So instead of the trigger pushing on the hammer strut and rotating the hammer, the hammer now is pulling the trigger to the rear by going up with it. And it gets to the point where they again, just like we saw with the strut and the trigger, well, they get to a point where they're now past that horizontal position of where they're pivoting at, and they start to come further apart. Well, then that allows the sear engagement from the hammer to lock on to the sear essentially. It's a little notch in there. And now the trigger is blocking the hammer from going forward until we pull the trigger. I'm gonna let this forward gently. I guess I don't need to. But when we pull the trigger, the hammer goes forward and it rebounds the exact same way it did in double action. We see that the trigger pushes the, the bolt forward and resets to its position. Everything goes back just like it was before. Let's go ahead and take out the mainspring here and we'll look a little more closely at some stuff. Kind of a tight spring, but that's all it is there. That's where it goes into the stirrup. Let's go ahead and get the stirrup out of the way. You can see it's just kind of a, a chain link sort of device there. Make sure I'm in frame. So now we have really most of the spring tension relieved. And you see that it catches there. It didn't do it the first time because we don't have the spring in, but that's where it catches. Boom, comes forward. Nothing resets like it's supposed to because you don't have the spring to drive it. Let's look at this surface here because this is kind of an important one. And you see that it has these angles cut right there. And that's what works with this surface of the rebound arm. So if we flip it kind of over, 
that is what is pushing forward and causing that tension so that the paw sits forward like that. Now this gives us a little bit better view of what's happening with your hammer strut. You see the hammer strut there is above the trigger. And basically the back end of the trigger, the sear here, on its bottom side, it has hammer. On the top side, it has hammer. So whether you move the trigger, the hammer moves, right? See how that happens? And then if you move the hammer, the trigger moves. So they're essentially tied together that way. If I take the hammer out, now you can see the transfer bar and it moves up and down. Oh, I fell off of it. It moves up And down like that and when it's up it covers the firing pin so you see the firing pin there when you pull the trigger it comes up in the way and then that allows the hammer to strike it and carry on the energy to the firing pin, which would allow it to protrude from the front here. You kind of see that happening. It's kind of hard to get my thumb in there. Yeah, you can see it. Now, one really cool thing about the Colt Python is it does not really have during normal operation it doesn't have anything that stops the rearward movement of the trigger let's put some of this stuff back in and i will show that to you pretty simple mechanism overall nothing really too complicated with it you can go ahead and put the rebound arm in first you can kind of do this in a couple different ways, but I find it easier to get that started. And you see that is the pin that connects the pawl to the trigger. So the rebound arm isn't actually interacting with the trigger directly. It also isn't interacting with the It also isn't interacting directly with the transfer bar. Okay, and those are back together now. This is always a little bit tricky getting this stuff back in, but I'm gonna do my best here to not make a, an embarrassment of it. Yeah, maybe I can just do it by hand. We'll see. Get it part way in and then compress it. I find that this parallel snap ring plier works well for this task. There it is. A little tricky. I can sometimes do it a little more smoothly than that, but trying not to block too much your view makes it more challenging than it normally is even. So I'm going to put the cylinder back in here. And you heard that click, that was the bolt popping up into one of the stop notches there. And then I'm gonna push forward on the latch pin and so it won't push out and it can't rotate. So that's what has this all secured. Let's see what happens on double action with the cylinder in place. If I pull the trigger, 
all these same things happen and you see that it moves down the bolt and that unlocks the cylinder and the pawl pushes forward on the ratchet. Now the really cool thing here, if we go all the way through the cycle, it binds up tight. There is no play in the cylinder at all. You'd say, well, how is there no play in the cylinder? Because the bolt there inside the stop notch, well, they can't be a perfect fit. There has to be some play. There's no play. And the reason for that is that your finger is basically taking all the tension out of the system. The bolt is in the stop notch. The pawl is pushing here, and what's actually stopping the rearward movement of the trigger is the bolt. You're saying, what? That doesn't make any sense. It's pretty wild. There is no trigger stop. There's no over-travel stop. There's no over-travel adjustment on this Python. The way this works is that you're pulling the trigger, it's pushing up on the pawl, it's advancing the cylinder. The cylinder advances until the bolt is able to spring into one of the stop notches, and then you keep on pulling the trigger, and what it does is it binds the cylinder against the bolt. So it's bound up there, that means that your Paul cannot advance any further. It means your trigger can't come back any further. And that is what makes the Python action so tight. That's why where when you look at some other designs of revolvers, you'll see that you know it has a little bit of, uh, of play when even when the trigger is pulled, the trigger will be pulled, the hammer will have moved forward and there will be a little bit of play. Not a lot, not enough to cause a problem, but a little bit. And the Python doesn't have that. When the Python's trigger is pulled and the hammer has fallen, it locks up solid. And that is because what is actually stopping that trigger is your bolt. It, it is the stop notches in the cylinder are stopping the trigger's movement. That's what locks up the action and gives you that really, really tight, consistent, uh, just cylinder seizing up is, is the best way to describe it. It's not like other designs where, you know, you have the bolt essentially just sitting in the notch and it's allowed to, to wiggle a little bit. Sometimes those get a little bit more tension because of the pawl kind of arresting it this is not that way. It's not really being pinched between two different things that are limiting the movement. It's, it is your finger is binding the whole system. The energy you're putting into it is through all this roundabout way causing, causing the cylinder to bind up, causing that stop notch to bind up on the bolt. And it's really cool. Uh, that's not something you see on Typical designs, it's, as far as I know, very unique to the Python. It seems to me like over time, if you had any wear developing, this would, rather than allowing the gun to loosen up, just sort of accommodate that wear within reason. Of course, it would eventually get out of time, but uh, prior to that, you know, on other designs where you have maybe a little bit of looseness on something that's getting a little older, on the Python, uh, it's going to accommodate uh, a fair bit of that. It's going to adapt uh, continuously to the wear that it has and basically keep the gun tight. It, it's, it's adaptive to wear, and it is, I mean, it's just a great design. It's a great design. I think that pretty well covers it. I mean, we can go ahead and, and go through this one more time just so that so you can see. But you pull, I have to 
keep some tension on here, otherwise it'll walk off. So I apologize for blocking it, but you pull the trigger, it advances the cylinder via the pawl here, moving up. You know, your transfer bar is in place. It has worked against the bolt there. Everything resets using the rebound lever. And that pretty much uh, gets you there. And at this point, you know, once you're done firing it, you would, well, we can put it back together real quick, show you. This isn't the way I would normally do this, but yeah, this is going to be problematic because what I need to do is have cylinder out. Really nicely fitted side plates on these pythons. There it is. And if we put this back in. Can't do it that way. Okay. And so everything, of course, isn't screwed back together. But if you wanted to unload it, boom. And then that is the unloading process. I probably didn't follow along with Matt's video exactly, but that kind of gives you an idea, more of a, a thorough explanation, I guess, of exactly what's happening and why, what these parts are supposed to do. Uh, so definitely look down in the description, check out his animation. And if you're seeing something in there that you say, man, what, what exactly is going on here? You can come to this video and maybe see whatever it is. So thanks for watching, folks. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, check out Matt's channel. It's great. And we'll see you on the next video with maybe more Colt Python, maybe something else. But catch you later.